So there we are. Uh, we, we've talked about the, uh, the starfish, and we've talked about all of these other types of organisms on the planet. We talked about reptiles. Oh, no, we haven't talked about reptiles yet, but we have talked about... Um, sorry, we haven't gotten to the really cool uh, things that have a backbone. We've talked about a lot of things that have had no backbone so far. Uh, today we're going to start getting into those organisms that have a backbone in, our, um, in this one supergroup called chordate. So all these chordates have a few things in common. They all have a notochord. That's this brown thing right here. They all have a uh, dorsal, uh, uh, dorsal hollow nerve cord. So that's right above it. Pharyngeal slits. Um, these are going to be, in, in this particular image, these are the um, openings near the red places there where blood circulates. They allow for um, oxygen transfer. <coughs> and they all have a postanal tail. So anus over here, tail in the back. So all chordates have these four things in common. And you guys know I like lists. So expect a list to pop up sometime saying, I don't know, what are the characteristics of chordates? If you were hypothetically to have to write a, an essay about characteristics of chordates, here's the four sentences for your essay. Does that help? Anybody who might be confused on what to write in an essay? No? OK, just checking. So the notochord, it's a flexible hollow rod. It lies just between the digestive system, which we saw in the dissection, and uh, a band of nerves, not just running, a band of nerves running the, um, along the, the length of the body. You have a nerve cord. A nerve cord is a really, really thick band of nerve cells. Um, these typically run the entire length of the animal and they end in a large collection of nerve cells clustered together. So some organisms have this big cluster of nerve cells that's called a ganglia. You have a big collection of nerve cells called what? At one end of your body. And, no, one end. Yeah, your brain, right? It's like, there you go, it's your brain. Pharyngeal slits, they're going to uh, open up near the outside uh, typically near the mouth of the organism, they allow for um, water to move through the mouth and out through the slit. These pharyngeal slits are going to be used for uh, oxygen exchange with the environment. Some organisms actually use this for feeding. They, have, um, they open their mouth and then all these food particles come in, they go across the pharyngeal slits and they get caught there, and then the animal uses its tongue to sort of wipe its pharyngeal slits clean and swallow the food. In fish, the pharyngeal slits ended up becoming uh, gills, the gill arches. So there we go. That's what makes a chordate. We've got a notochord. We've got a uh, dorsal uh, nerve cord. We've got pharyngeal slits. And, oh, of course, we've got the post-anal tail. All chordates, including you, have uh, a tail of various lengths located right behind their anus. So here's uh, obviously a, a lizard's tail. Here's a human tail. You can see down here we're going to have the anus. There's your postanal tail. It's all fused together. Yes? Do humans have a pharyngeal slit? We do while we're developing. Oh, it goes away. Like right. So eventually, for, for a lot of for our terrestrial organisms, they go away okay. uh, during development. So of the chordates, we have a few big groups, and actually one really big group and two very small groups. Um, we've got the uochordates and the cephalochordates, and then over here we have the vertebrates. So let's talk about those two oddball ones, and then we'll get into the big class. The cephalochordates are filter feeders. It's like what's called the lancet. This is the lancet fish. Fish. It's not a fish. Uh, this is the lancet, a type of organism that buries itself in the sand. So it buries itself all the way in, really, so just its head is showing. And then um, it sits there and it waves its tentacles and it grabs anything it can with its tentacles, pulling it into its mouth. It is sort of the archetypical uh, chordate because it shows everything in the adult stage. You can see pharyngeal slits. 
you could see a postanal tail, you could see the dorsal nerve cord, you could see the notochord. Everything is like perfect in this. So this is usually what we use to um, teach about um, chordates. Euchordates are like the tunicate. This doesn't look like an animal. It looks almost like a heart, honestly. Um, it looks, it, it doesn't have a postanal, I don't see a postanal tail, I don't see pharyngeal slits. Uh, it looks like a sponge almost. So, it looks like a sponge in its adult form. The reason it's classified as a chordate, in this case a eurochordate, is because in its larval form, it's very obviously a chordate. It's got a postanal tail, it's got pharyngeal slits, it's got the, uh, a notochord and a dorsal um, nerve cord. All of those are, um, this is, sorry, this is a tadpole. This is, this is what I was, uh, uh, the bottom one is the eurochordate. You can see it looks similar to a tadpole, and I don't think any of us would argue that a tadpole is a, um, is a chordate. So we've got our cephalochordates and our eurochordates. And those are sort of almost a basal group. They're ancient lineage. Then we get into this massive group of vertebrates, vertebrata. This is uh, organisms that actually have a backbone to them. The phylum vertebrata has several characteristics on top of the chordate characteristics. It does have all those same chordate characteristics and some more. It'll have a vertebral column, a cranium, an endoskeleton, what's called a neural crest, and very diverse internal organs that are highly conserved. I'll go through each. So while a vertebrate is um, developing, the notochord, which we talked about with chordates, is slowly replaced by a much, much stiffer interlocking material. In us, it's bone. In some organisms, it's cartilage. But basically, it, um, it, it, it becomes a much more protective layer. And you need that protection to sort of uh, cover up the very, very delicate nerve cord. We also want to protect that big cluster of nerves at one end of our body, in this case, our brain. So we have to protect our brain using what's called a cranium. The cranium is, again, very hard material. It could be uh, cartilage, like in a shark. It could be bone, like in us. Um, and the brain sits inside. Now, the brain sitting there, we're going to talk more about the brain structure when we get to the nervous system. It's not just sitting in there by itself. There's some fluid in there to prevent it from um, banging around too much. Turns out, if you bang your head too hard, uh, you get damage to it, and your brain, and then you uh, can't live long. Vertebrates have an endoskeleton. So they have an internal living skeleton made up of bone or cartilage. That skeleton provides a connection point for muscles to allow for more efficient movement. It also provides structure, stability. You have a neural crest. Uh, this is a group of stem cells. We talked a little bit about stem cells. Stem cells are cells that have the potential to go on to become, uh, become other types of cells. They're sort of, they're still um, multiplying. They're still undergoing mitosis. So the neural crest in vertebrates is going to what, be what build the skeleton and all those hard structures. And they have really diverse internal organs. The mesoderm has differentiated into a complex system of organs. And those organs are highly conserved across different animal uh, vertebrate groups. So when we're looking at, um, at, at vertebrates, you're going to see the same basic structures. You're going to see a small intestine and a large intestine, a heart, lungs, or gills, depending on where the organism is. So questions on vertebrates? So far, so good?